Good morning. Would you make your way to your seats and we'll start our worship this morning. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created all for our sake became poor so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Good morning, church. Together, may the grace and peace of God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord with the Holy Spirit be on us this morning. I want to welcome everybody here today, especially if those of you that might be visiting. You might see several of us in blue shirts. Our VBS is tonight. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but uh, a lot of work has gone into that, and that's why several of us are wearing these blue t-shirts. I know it might be a little odd seeing Jonathan in a t-shirt rather than a suit and tie or something like that so but uh, once in a while I do wear t-shirts I don't know if anybody knew that but if you're visiting us we thank you so much again for being here we would really like to meet you and connect with you so please fill out an ivory colored visitor card on the back of the pew in front of you place that in the black security box on your way out or you can go to goodmanoaks.churchtrack.com and fill that information out there um, also to our members, of course, take the green card and do the same. You can also go to goodmanoaks.churchtrack.com and log in there and click on your attendance. Um, if for some reason you are not receiving the bulletin, of course, we want to make sure that you do. So please email the church to let us know at office at goodmanoaks.com. Also, we want to thank those who are worshiping with us via the conference call and certainly online on the live stream. We'd like to remind you, just mute your phones out of consideration for others who might be watching or listening. Let's enter into God's word this morning. Psalm 133, verse 1 through 3. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This is God's word. As we can see here, definitely about this call to unity and how God always commanded all the way back in the Old Testament for his children to be not only a family relationship, brothers as it's called here, but to dwell in a place of unity and to have uh, display unity throughout who they were as a nation, and that was to trickle into other nations. And hopefully we can use something like VBS this morning, um, or this evening rather, where we can display unity not only as a unified front here, but also to those who might be coming from our community. Got several big announcements today of things going on. 
And so just please stay with me on this. I'm going to do a little bit of a group activity so you understand how important these are and make sure that you heard me. Teenagers, whenever I'm in class and I say capiche, you say Kapash. All right. So if I happen to say capiche, that means do you understand? You just reply kaposh. All right, here we go. So VBS kicks off tonight at 6 o'clock. Our VBS will run from tonight all the way through Wednesday night. And you can see, again, several of us wearing those blue shirts. A lot of planning and a lot of work has gone into VBS this summer. Our theme is the Jesus story. We're going to be covering the birth, miracles, Last Supper, and the crucifixion. So let's all come out and make it a huge success. Uh, volunteers, be sure you are here at 515 Skip practice starts today at 1.30 to 4.30. Capiche? Look at that. All right. Second, there are two things running simultaneously with Vacation Bible School. One is the important school supply drive. Folks can come as early as 5.30 to receive a bag of school supplies. Our church members have generously donated. And then also, if you look in the children's church column, you'll see something about flip-flops to Ukraine. This is an opportunity for us to bring flip-flops and donate them during our VBS times. We need flip-flops of all sizes, kids, teens, and adults. And there are a few other items that might be needed there for the Ukraine mission effort. You can check the bulletin for those things. A reason you might want to bring those flip-flops is because I heard Chris was going to be the one who's pied in the face. No other ministers, though, are going to do that. All right. So, um, so anyways, that might be something you might want to see. So be sure that you bring your flip-flops. Capiche? Sweet. Third, and upcoming, our upcoming program for small groups is approaching quickly. Matthew has worked very hard on getting that together. Several of you have signed up. There's still time to do that. See the bulletin for details on that. Our kickoff of that is August the 7th. I want to make an announcement as well. If you looked at the bulletin, very uh, special announcement from our eldership um, about our seniors and anyone who may be interested in attending a Christian college. There are several that are listed there. I think there's six or seven schools um, that they are willing to give and have approved a $2,000 scholarship annually for those students who are going to that school. Did I get that right? All right. And um, so they, we want to encourage uh, our, our students to be interested in going to a Christian school. By the way, uh, along with David Underwood, we now have two additional ones going to Harding University. Brian Singleton and Everett Reichart is going to go there in the fall as well, from what I understand. So, All right, now this is, the, this is very important. I'm going to give like the next month's announcements. If you look at the youth ministry, You'll see this there. So if you've never read the bulletin before, this is a perfect opportunity for you to look along with me. This week we got Matthew preaching this morning, VBS tonight. On June July the 24th, we're kicking off with Caruso sermons. We are going to have five next Sunday, two in the morning, and then followed by some ministerial comments, and then three in the evening. We need to show up and show out for our boys in Caruso. And then on the 31st, Todd McMillan, the intern, our intern, my intern, we're going to be using him that morning to preach. And then the afternoon, because we don't have night service on July 31st, which is our fifth Sunday, in the afternoon we're going to eat and we'll have our, uh, our afternoon, are we eating? I forgot that part. We are, yes. So we are eating together on the 31st, fifth Sunday, and then we will have three more of our Caruso sermons. They're only limited to 10 minutes, by the way, so keep that in mind. Um, and then the next week, August 7th, Matthew will be preaching to us, and then we will do our small group kickoff that night. And then August 14th, we're going to finish up with our final two Caruso sermons in the morning, and then we'll have regular night service that Sunday night. Capiche? A little louder. Capiche? All right. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you for... Uh, your presence, and please join together as we worship, and we hope that you find encouragement, encouragement in that.
On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed. By blood they him their king in strains deep. <coughs> I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to join. Hear all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus love. Lee name shall victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great I am and bow before the great I am while everlasting ages roll eternal love shall feast their souls and scenes of bliss forever new rise in succession to their view. Rise in succession to their view. Holy, holy, holy. God of hosts on high adored, who like me thy praise should sing, O Almighty King, holy, holy, holy Lord. God of hosts on high adored, you on the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high above all else all else and we come to worship at your feet. We place you on the highest place, for you are the great high priest. We place you high above all at your feet and we come to you and worship at your feet. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this, this building that we have to come and gather as a church. We pray that this worship is pleasing to you. We pray for your guidance in this worship. We want it to be all about you, Father. We love you, and we are so blessed to have you as our God. Be with us as we go through life. Be with those that are directing this church, the preacher, the ministers, the deacons, the elders. We pray that they will have your guidance. And finally, Father, we pray that we will be with you in the end. And your son leads us. And in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Today I'm going to read from John chapter 20, verses 24, 28. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into the side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. This is God's word. We're going to sing the first and last verse of 918 before the Lord's Supper. First and last verse only. Out of my bonded sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glory Yes, face to behold, Jesus, I come to thee. Recently, Phil stood before you at this time and uh, gave you some insight to what Scripture tells us about what was going on and, and the horrible, horrible situation that occurred that led up to Jesus' death on the cross. I thought Phil did a great job of painting that picture so we could possibly see some of the agony. This was a bad place. It was a bad situation. The beatings, the spitting, the disrespect, the carrying of the cross, the cross hitting the ground and Jesus being hung on that cross blood being shed but just days before that happened Jesus gathered with his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14 beginning in verse 32 we get get some insight to that he said and they went to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples sit here while I pray and he took with him Peter James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground. And he prayed that if it possible, the hour might pass from him. 
And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet what I will, not, not what I will, but what you will. That was the first of three different prayers that Jesus fell to the ground and prayed fervently, please, I don't want to go through this. This is the worst of the worst. I'm going to be separated from you, God, even if it's just for a short time, and I don't want that to happen. Sweat drops of blood. Have you ever been there? Have you ever kind of been there where there's something so oppressive on your heart and on your body and on your, on your being that you just don't have anywhere else to go but God? And it's three times over, God, please let it pass. Jesus knew what the course was ahead of him, and he took it on willingly. He took it on willingly. Men, will you come forward, please? He took it on willingly for each one of us. It, it wasn't just for that audience that was there then. It was for each one of us, and for all time's sake, Jesus went to the cross. And he said, I'll take it. I'll take it for you, and I'll take it for you, and you, and every one of you. I don't want it to be that way. I wish it wasn't that way, but because it is that way, I'm willing to do it. And so we assemble around this table every Lord's Day for that purpose of doing again what he asked us to do in response to his death. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moment in time that you were willing to give up everything for us. Father, thank you that Jesus was a sacrifice that allows us to stand whole in your sight as terrible as that was at that time. Father, we're grateful that we can assemble and we pray that we, pray, we, we play proper uh, homage to that sacrifice that was made on our behalf. That we remember appropriately the things that were done and the moments that were shared that we too can stand whole. So Father, I ask you to bless us. Bless us as we partake of this bread. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to remember. Father, we, we realize that the shedding of blood was, was necessary. We realize that from teachings of Scripture that 
the plan was in place that through the shedding of blood, our sins could be washed away. We realize that and we had to stand on the promise and on the hope that we are washed clean and we stand whole in front of your sight because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. So Father, as we do that this morning, as we partake of this cup, we pray that we'll do so in a manner that's pleasing, that will, that will give proper honor to the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's all be standing for the next two songs for the Lord. This time we could also dismiss the children to children's church. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He bathed my narrow in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Have a little talk with Jesus. Let us He will hear our prayers. And he will answer by and by. So when you feel a little prayer for yearning, as your heart unto heaven is turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. So when you feel a little prayer for your, as your heart unto heaven is turning, find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. He took my burdens all away, up to a brighter day he gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing in my heart joy bells. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. 
he lifted me from sin and doubt. From sin and doubt, oh, praise his name. He is my king, a wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with a chorus. Grand, he gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. morning church today's scripture will be coming from first John 1 through second chapter first verse that which was from the beginning what we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the world of life the word of life this life was made manifest and we have we have seen it and testified it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the father and with and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard we, we proclaim also to you so that you to me to may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him to proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we, ha we, we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, or us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say, we have no, not, we, if we say we have not sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is God's word. Pray for me, please. Our Lord and God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you this morning about walking in the light, the scripture that Kellen just read to us. But first, I want to talk um, for a minute about bones, okay? Uh, skeletons in particular. Um, I, I know a couple things about this. I'm not bragging, but I did receive an Alabama public education, okay? So I'm qualified to speak about a few things. Um, I know that there are different types of skeletal structures for different creatures on the earth. There are, see if you know this, there are those creatures whose skeleton is on the outside, like beetles and crabs, and that kind of skeleton is called a what? Exoskeleton, very good. And there are also creatures like us and kitty cats and dogs, you know, whose skeletons are on the inside and they are called, okay, fewer people knew that one, endoskeletons, that's right. 
That's about all I knew about it <laughs> to start. But then uh, I, was re I read Eugene Peterson, actually, had a very helpful book, and he was using this as an illustration. And he said that uh, exoskeletons have the benefits from the start of life. At the early formative years, exoskeletons are better because they protect you. And they keep you safe from danger and from predators. They, they just keep you safe a little better. You know, little, little kids. And they're vulnerable, so it keeps you safe better. Makes them less vulnerable. But then endoskeletons, they are, they are more vulnerable. Endoskeletons are more vulnerable from the start. You know, little kids tumble and fall and th things like that happen because they're, they're more vulnerable. But however, the, the, thing, the bad thing about it is exoskeletons, they just molt. And so they change into a different form. There's no memory. However, with endoskeletons like us, while we are more vulnerable, the other side of that is that we have memory and that we can reach higher forms of consciousness. I'm talking to you about this because I want to tell you this morning about how we can reach a higher form of of consciousness. I'm talking to you this morning about vulnerability. I'm talking to you <clears throat> about knowing and being known and how important that is for us. Let me ask you this. Who really knows you? I mean, really. Like, who really knows what's going on right now in your heart? Who really knows those anxieties and fears that you have? Who really knows what you have really done? Who really knows that? How many of us have been brave enough really to face that and think about who we are, really? It's kind of rare. What we want to do is to protect ourselves. God, see, God made you, every person in this room, God made you with an endoskeleton. What that means is God made you to be vulnerable. God made you that way. But what some of us would prefer to do, at least psychologically or uh, emotionally or spiritually, we prefer to be exoskeletons. We prefer to protect ourselves. We prefer not to let anything in. And we prefer to keep everything in and not to let anything out. And by doing that, we are restricting ourselves to where we will not have that higher form of consciousness. If I could use it in John's language, to be known is to walk in the light. You cannot be known without being vulnerable. And we see this in John's letter. So John, we have this letter from John this morning. And John knew Jesus. And Jesus knew John. And John really makes this clear from the start. He is saying, I knew this guy. That which we have, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands. John is saying, I knew him. I know Jesus better than you do, actually. I mean, John was, I mean, literally top 12 disciples. He was among them. He was among the top three disciples, so close to Jesus. John says, I am the one who touched him. I saw him. I heard him. I laid my head on his chest. I raced Peter to the empty tomb. John knew Jesus. And he is saying, I've got a message for you this morning. The one who knew Jesus so well says, there is something you need to know about Jesus. And so he continues. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from, the, from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I gotta be honest with you. That's a lot of buildup, isn't it? That's a lot of buildup to say God is light. You know? What, what is so big about that? Why is he saying this? This, if I had one thing to say, John has more things to say, but at the start he's saying, I want you to know this thing about God. God is light. Amen. One thing you need to know: John is battling a heresy called Gnosticism. Okay? A heresy means a false teaching that divides the church. 
And this was growing, second century, this became a huge thing. That, it was very, very, very bad. They did not think good thoughts about God. God was not good in their eyes. And so matter, anything God made is not good. And so matter is not good, they thought. Gnostics thought this. And so they thought one, one repercussion of this is, gee, God could not have become a man. Our bodies are evil. So that could not have happened. Something, something weird. Maybe he seemed like he appeared to be a man. There was different ideas. But also, what do you do with your body? You know, God, to the Gnostics, it's from the word to know. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek. So they, they, it's okay because God gives you knowledge. God gives you this inner spark of divine life. And that's inside you or up here somewhere. That's what makes you saved. Your body doesn't matter, okay? Your body is evil, it doesn't matter. But then you got to ask, what do you do with your body? You got two options. Gnostics did one of two things with their bodies. One group of Gnostics said, we're going to beat our bodies. We're going to starve. Our, we will not have any pleasure in our bodies. But that's no fun, right? <laughs> there were a lot of those Gnostics around. Most Gnostics did the other thing. They're like, you know what? It doesn't matter what you do in your body. Eat what you want to eat. Do what you want to do. Sleep with whomever you want to sleep with. Whatever you want to do to your body, it's fine. There is no such thing as sin. Because you have the inner spark. Your knowledge is what matters, not what you do. John calls that for the lie that it is. He says, you got to think better thoughts about God. God is light. But he also says, this is the bad news. You are darkness. There is darkness in you. And you are actually in the darkness. I don't want to get ahead of myself, though. He's saying God is light. Let's start there. What does it mean that God is light? When John uses this imagery in this context and really throughout the writings of John, like we'll see in a minute in John's gospel, when he says God is light, he's saying this is exposure. He's saying God is truth. God is honest. What God is, when God is not just in the light that you can see God. You know, God is actually the light. And so what that means is, it's not just that you can see God, it is that God shines on you, and God sees you. And we see this, God, God values honesty, okay? That, that, this is why we read that John, Gospel of John reading earlier, because when Jesus appeared to the apostles after his resurrection, Thomas was not there. And so the apostles told him, we saw Jesus, and Thomas says two things. One, I don't believe you. But then he says something very brutal, I think, very harsh. He says, I will not believe unless I put my finger in his nail marks and I see his nail marks and I put my hand in his side. I will not believe. Who says that? When, when you are in the wake of a tragedy, in the wake of your world being turned upside down, who says, I don't believe you and I won't believe you until I da 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 whatever? Who says that? Someone who values honesty says that. Because see, John, or Thomas and John, they were part of this group of men, a small group of men, you might say, and they valued honesty. So the reason Thomas said this, he, he was grieving. Thomas is in his feelings. He's grieving himself. He had this thing, and he just said it. Because Thomas felt like he could. Thomas felt like with these men, I can be honest. They can take it. They're hurting. I'm hurting. I can be honest and say this maybe hurtful thing. And so he said it. So in John's letter, he's talking about the same thing. John is talk, not talking about sharing your sufferings like we talked about last week in general. John is talking about sharing in regards to your own sinfulness. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What does that mean? When you hear that phrase, walk in the light, what you're probably hearing is, are the echoes of all those sermons you've heard on this passage, which most of them probably have said, Walk in the light means you do good things, okay? If you do good things, right, if you think good thoughts, if you're a good person, 
You have fellowship with the church. If you are good, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from your sin. Contrast that with if you're, if you're in the darkness, that means we, we hear you do bad things and you think bad thoughts and you're not doing, not doing right. I will say walking the light has that idea in it that you're walking in purity. That's an idea, but it's not what John is saying here. When John says walk in the light, he's saying you're, you're, you're honest. Walking in the light is being honest. Walking in darkness is being dishonest in regards to your sinfulness. I don't know that y'all hear me yet, okay? John 3. Now, I can prove this because later on he's going to say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you, if you were to go back to John chapter 3, I think what John is doing here, he's saying the same thing Jesus said. In John 3 verse 19, Jesus said, This is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and men hate the light. They love darkness. Why do they love the darkness? Because their deeds are evil. And so they do not come into the light, lest they should be exposed. John, John is saying, and Jesus is saying, why do we stay in the darkness? Why do we not walk in the light? Because we're trying to hide the evil things we have done. And so when John says walk in the light, he's not saying straight up and fly right, guys. He's saying, be honest about what you've done. Come out of the shadows. Come out of hiding and be honest about what you've done. That's why Jesus says you're in darkness. You're in darkness because you don't want anybody else to see, but coming in the light means we are exposed. And church, what this means is if God is light, if God is light, what that means is you and I are exposed. It means God sees you. God sees you better than your spouse sees you. God sees you better than your parents see you. God sees you better than it. God is closer to you than your own breath. He sees everything. He sees that stuff you're hiding on your phone that you think you can do little tricks. And do it. No, he sees it, okay? He saw what you did last night. He saw what you did years ago that you have kept a secret. He sees everything. He sees more of you than anybody else sees. You cannot hide from God. He sees your lust. He sees your anger. He sees your hatred, even if you don't see it. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you find some tribe somewhere, some group, some church who will say things, who won't talk about those things, you know, but who will say things that make you feel better about yourself. No, God, God still sees you. You're not hiding. It doesn't matter if you construct a worldview where, you know, those people are the villains. I'll baptize my own. My sins are not as bad as their sins. Compared to the light of God, you are in darkness. Everybody here, all right? You are in darkness because in God, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So what this means is that if you think you do not have sins to confess, you are a liar. And that is what John, I'm not mad at you, okay? I'm not trying to be mean to you. That's what John says. We lie and do not practice the truth. We deceive ourselves and we make him a liar. You cannot believe the gospel and believe that you are a good person. You can't do it. In God, God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. Maybe compared to somebody else. Maybe compared to those sinners, you're not as bad, you know, by the world standards. Maybe, you don't, maybe you're not that far in the darkness, but if you've got a foot in darkness, you are in darkness. You are hiding in the darkness. So we cannot say that. If we are in darkness and only God knows our sins, we got a choice to make. We can stay in that darkness with God knowing our sins and us just struggling and struggling and struggling, or we can walk into the light. And as John says, be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Can I say more, church? Let me tell you this. Why, did, why is light the thing that he, he focuses on? How does coming in the light cleanse us via the blood of Jesus? How does that work? Let me give you an image. This is not in the Bible, but it's a very good and true image. 
Sin is like a fungus. It grows in the dark and it feeds on manure. Okay, y'all hear me? Let me tell y'all, okay? Sin is like a fungus. It grows in the dark and it feeds on manure. What that means is our sin grows when we keep it in the dark. Your sin, the more secretive you are about your sin, I promise you the more that sin is going to grow. And the more you lie about it, that is, the more you lie and say, I'm okay. I've got this under control, you know. I'm not as bad as those people over there. I really haven't done that bad. I'm going to stop. I'm going to do better. This was a little momentary slip up. I will be better. Liar. Liar. You are lying to yourself and you are feeding the sin. If you want sin to explode in your life, don't say a word about it. Keep it to yourself. Keep lying to yourself. And your sin's going to grow. And let me tell you, church, this is an epidemic in the church. This is everywhere. We all say we sin. Okay. Everybody in here would say, well, I sin. I sin every day. I'm not denying I sin. Okay. How do you sin? You come to me and say, Matthew, I sin every day. I'll say, well, okay. What did you do today then? I'll tell you what I did. Okay. That's confession. That's confessing sin. Not the generic, I'm a sinner. Well, what specifically are you? Are you lustful? Are you angry? Are you, hate, are you hateful? Like, what, what? John notices a connection. I want to talk about walking the light a little more here because John notices a connection between light and fellowship. This is where confession comes in. John, John has this curious phrase. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, first he says, we have fellowship with one another. And then he says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If I were writing this, thank God I'm not, I did not. But if I were writing this, I would think he'd say, and I would say, if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and we have fellowship. Because in my, for most of my life, that was the idea. You do good things, right, okay? You repent of your sin, it's all good, God forgives you. Then you're connected to the church. John is not saying that. It is in the fellowship that you're walking in the light. It is in this confession of sins. The way you kill your sin is to bring it into the light. You confess it to God, and I would argue you confess it to your brothers and sisters. That, my friends, will kill your sin. When you've got other people who see it, because sin's a fungus, remember? How do you kill a fungus? You bring it in the light, and it dies, it will shrivel up. You stop feeding it manure. You stop saying, it's okay, I'm all right. I've got this. You don't have this. You don't have it. It is in the community that your sins are cleansed. It is not go have your little talk with Jesus and get right. Then I can go and I can worship God. It's all right. No, you come to, if you're struggling, go to God, pray to God, but come to the church. Tell your brothers and sisters, because I promise you what's likely going to happen, you're going to keep on struggling with that. By yourself, because sin grows in the darkness. So bring it to the light. I know, I know, I'm preaching to some people this morning who feel like they've got their sin under control. You feel like I've, I've, I've worked hard on this. This is my battle to take. I've got to handle this. Folks, you do not handle sin. Sin handles you. You cannot handle sin. Let, let me ask you this. You're handling sin. How's it working out for you? How long have you been handling that sin? Six months? A year? Two years? Ten years? Twenty years? How long? Because sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to have you, and it is eating you up. So what do you have to do? I like what Ray Ortland said. Ray Ortland said, we got two choices. We can be impressive, or we can be known. Okay, so if you want to hide, if, if you are concerned about your image, if it's really important for you, for people to think a certain way about you, this is going to be hard for you because you want to be impressive. You want to impress people. I want them to think I'm, you know, whatever you want them to think you are. Or you can be known. People can really know who you are. And when that happens, friends, that is fellowship. Okay. Meet and greets, how to do, what's your name, where you, where you from? That's not fellowship. The fellowship he's talking about is this partnership. 
And I'm telling you, you keep living in that exoskeleton, protecting yourself as you think you are, but remaining hidden and untouchable. That's a choice. Or you can come into the light, which is, it's hard to do. Come into the light, be vulnerable, and you will find family. You will find fellowship. You'll find forgiveness. You'll find light, and you'll find life. We confess our sins to God. What I'm saying is, he's not the only one we confess it to. All right? John may be saying you confess it to God. You know where else the Bible says about confession? James 5, 16. Confess your sins to one another. Why? That you may be healed. That's why we do this. Confessing your sins beyond that kind of generic, I'm a sinner confession, that will change your life. It will change your life completely. And I want to tell you, I'm not saying this as someone who's not willing to do this, okay? I will be transparent with you. I have been that liar. I have been the one who said, I have no sin. But let me tell you, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I came to that light. I I exposed that sin. I brought it to my brothers and sisters. And I felt that pain. It is painful. It hurts. It's scary being vulnerable like that. But I felt the pain. It burned. It burned away that unrighteousness. And then after that burning pain, you will feel the warmth of God's love. You will feel fellowship. You think you have fellowship. You will find fellowship in the confession of sins. So I want to say a couple specific things about this. Okay. How, How do you do this? Uh, two things. One, one, I want to give a couple criteria for this. Go, you can confess sins to whoever you want to confess sins to. I would give you a little guidance, though. Two criteria. One, find someone you trust to do this. Someone you trust. All right, you can come to me. If you don't trust me, that's fine. My feelings aren't hurt. Okay. Come to your shepherds. Come to your brothers and sisters. Whoever you trust. Somebody you trust is what you need to do with this. Okay. Because we, we want fellowship, right? You know the word fellowship means partnership? In the, in the New Testament world, that's what it meant. You go in business, you're, you're, you know, you go into business with somebody, you are partners. That's what we're supposed to be. But sometimes in the church, there are not partners, there are spies. You know what a spy does? A spy wants to know, but doesn't want to be known. Okay? We don't want spies in the church. We don't want people who know other people's business and go talk about that to other people. That those spies will need to repent of their sin because that is sin. Before you talk about somebody else's problems, you need to talk about your problems. Okay? So this is why trust is important. You find someone you trust. The other criteria is somebody who knows Jesus because they have been here. They have been in the darkness as well. Okay? This is one reason why we are starting small groups, okay? We want to foster an environment that builds that kind of trust. that goes beneath, goes deeper than surface level fellowship, but where you can create genuine relationships and have this kind of trust and fellowship where you feel like you can come into the light, okay? And be honest. That's one reason we're doing this. Now, the second thing I want to say, there are people... I'm sure there are people in this church who are dealing with what we've always called besetting sins. A besetting sin is something you just, you're doing it over and over and over and over again. Okay, it's it's really just kicking you and keeping you down. It's a very specific sin. And what I want to say is that if you're having a very specific sin, you may need to deal with that very specifically. Okay, what that may look like is a 12-step group or something like that. You know, if you're struggling with alcohol, there's an AA group, you know, that, that will help you. If you're struggling with any sort of addiction, with love addiction, shopping addiction, work addiction, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, a, a group is just a Google search away to help you. I'm not vouching for everything on Google, but I'm saying there are people in this world whom God has put here to help you. Okay, there are people that you can walk into the light with and be honest with, and they will help you kill that sin. You just need to expose yourself in these healthy, good contexts. Okay, 
Now, I've made everybody really uncomfortable, <laughs> said some hard things. I want to give you some good news now. Okay, the bad news is we sin. As John said, if we say we have no sin, we are liars. We're deceiving ourselves. Truth is not in us. We got some good news. The good news is, church, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Everything. That thing you think you can't ever fix. The thing that you do not want to bring to light. God can cleanse that. How does he do it? Keep reading. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sin, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation is a big word. I think it's found three times in the Bible. Propitiation is a sacrifice that appeases wrath. Okay? So you got two different parties who were at odds. One is at wrath against that other party. A propitiation is something you do to stop that wrath so that they can be reconciled. And that's the, the good news here. The bad news is God's wrath burns against sinners. Okay, that, that's just the truth. It's not a very popular truth, but it is the truth. God's wrath burns against sinners. But the good news is that God, in his great love, sent Jesus to live among us, to teach us, to go to the cross for our sins, so that God's wrath will be turned away forever to those who are in Christ. That is good news. The good news, bad news is God sees everything you are, everything inside you. But the good news is because of Jesus, now when God looks at you and he sees everything you have done, he has nothing but love for you. Why do we wear these exoskeletons? Because we want love. If people know us, they won't love us. What I want to tell you, church, God sees you and he loves you. I want to tell you that this church can see you and will see you if you let them and they will love you. We will love you. You don't have to be afraid. That is very good news. It is very good news because you can come into the light you can be vulnerable and still be loved. God knows you, and you are completely exposed before him. So i, I got to ask you this. Or I gotta, if you were to say, nobody's told me this, but if you were to say, Matthew, I don't feel loved in this church. The question I'm going to ask you is, have you made yourself known in this church? Have you made yourself known? How, or are you still hiding in the darkness? The only way you can be truly known, the, the only way you can be truly loved is to be truly known. Okay? This is scary, church, I know. But don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid because Jesus has gone before you. Jesus has gone before all of us. Jesus, the one who was invincible, the one who was invulnerable, the one who was in heaven at the right hand of God made himself vulnerable for us. He's the one who made your body, who formed your bones, who put your flesh together. He made himself so vulnerable that his back was turned to ground beef for us. Jesus was so vulnerable that he let us crucify him. We hung him up high. We strung him out wide. We nailed him to the cross. He went in the darkness so you can come into the light. So stop hiding in the darkness. Stop hiding, church. You can come in the light. You will be loved. You'll find forgiveness in Christ. He will forgive you of your sins. He'll wash your sins away. You will find a family in this church who will love you and take care of you. And you will find a future in heaven. So stop hiding. You do not have to walk alone. Why don't you walk up here now and come as we stand and sing this song of encouragement. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleanse it be in thy once open fount. I bring them, Savior, all to Thee, 
The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee. The grief I cannot tell. No word shall needed be. Thou knowest all so well. I bring my sorrow laid on me. O suffering Savior, all to thee. O suffering Savior, all to thee. My life I bring to thee. I would not be my own. O Savior, let me be. Thine ever, thine alone. My heart, my life, my all I bring to thee, my Savior and my King. To thee, my Savior and my King. Be seated. I, you know, I, I just love times like this. You know, you, you, you hear sermons like this, and there's such a conviction of, of where we are and, and who we are and our relationship with God and how Jesus has made everything possible for us. Reagan Davis has come forward this morning, and, and Reagan has made a, uh, a, a decision with eternal consequences. Reagan has decided that she'd like to be baptized into Christ. It, it's a, it's just such a moment, right? I mean, it's just, a, and, and we take the time here at Goodman Oaks to kind of, kind of, uh, just kind of celebrate it together. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So, Reagan, if you'd come up here with me, please, babe. We got this, right? Those of you that are uh, fellow believers, those of you that have been baptized into Christ and a member of his church, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. That's an awesome sight, isn't it? Yes. You know, I, I think we got about 400 or so here today, and I look through this audience, and 300 or so of you are standing right now, and what you're telling Reagan is we're all in this together. That from this point forward, that she's going to be a part of the church that Jesus died for and created. So we're celebrating. We're celebrating. I'm going to read just a little bit. Mike, won't you and Catherine come up here with us? I'm going to read some things here, and I'm going to ask you first to just agree and, and, and say I do. And then we'll take Reagan's confession right after that. Church, do you believe in the one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and sea, and all that is in them, who so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him might have eternal life, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I do. do you believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the, the only Son of God, who being the very nature God, emptied himself, born of Mary, baptized by John, fully immersed in human nature, was crucified, died and was buried and on the third day was raised, who ascended to the Father and is reigning now at the right hand of God Almighty, who shall come to judge the living, the dead, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I do. I do. do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who brooded over the waters of creation, at creation? who is given to you by God in this baptism to sanctify you, to seal you in Christ, and to dwell within you as the pledge of your inheritance, God forever, glorious in splendor and might. I do. Reagan, I'm going to ask you those, I'm going to make those same statements. And as we make those same statements, I'm going to ask you to say I do. In church, we're celebrating with her. Do you believe in the one God Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who had loved the world, that he, so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him might have eternal life, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I do. Do you believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who being the very nature of God, emptied himself, born of Mary, baptized by John, fully immersed in human nature, was crucified. He died and was buried and was raised on the third day, who ascended to the Father and is reigning now at the right hand of God, who shall come to judge the living and the dead, the King of kings, Lord of lords, the Lamb of God, who takes away every sin of the world. I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Lord and the giver of life, who's brooded over the waters of creation, who is given to you by God in baptism to sanctify you, to seal you in Christ, and to dwell within you as the pledge of your inheritance, God forever glorifies in splendor and might. I do. Reagan, I'll tell you this, that this is the proudest day in mom and dad's life, to see their daughter obey the gospel. And not only that, dad's about to baptize you. It's such a great, great moment that you'll never, ever forget. We love you, girl. Y'all go take care of this person. Love you, girl. While they get ready, we're going to go ahead and go through some announcements. And somebody out here, please give me a high sign when we're ready, and I'll, I'll kind of back up. we got a lot of announcements. Jonathan took, where, took uh, care of quite a few of them at the, uh, at the beginning. But VBS, right? VBS. I remember last year, about a week or two after our VBS week, we just kind of felt like this was the peak of the year. It was like everybody that we talked to around the church felt like we were walking about two or three feet off the ground. It was such a fun time and good time and celebration last year. And this year is going to be nothing less. It's going to be a great time, and it's a great time for all. That's, that's what, sometimes I think we forget that VBS is a church-wide event. It's for all of you. It's for all of you. Every night we've got something special going on. You're going to love the skits. You're going to love the skits. You're also going to love watching the kids as they move around from, from craft to craft. You're going to love that. We've also got adult classes every night. And I know most of you have sat through some of Marty's classes before and some of Marty's teaching. Well, Marty's gonna be teaching tonight and that's gonna be great. But some of you may not have sat through some classes when, with that Alan Davis talk. I have, Alan does a great job. You don't wanna miss an opportunity to sit in a classroom and let Alan teach to you. Anthony Ashton's gonna be teaching and uh, you don't wanna miss that. You wanna be sure you're here to to listen to Anthony and encourage Anthony as a teacher. I think it's gonna be a great, great night on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday night, Isaac Walker is gonna be teaching. I sat through a couple of Isaac's classes and I told Isaac this before, I, I just picked up some pearls of wisdom. I, Isaac kind of takes things maybe with a little different slant on it, but just opens up scripture and creates a, such an environment where you just kind of absorb it. So we're really excited, not only about what the kids are gonna be involved with and everything that's going on there. We're excited adults, what you're gonna have an opportunity to participate in. So plug in on, on those classes. It's gonna be, be a great, great, great time. Also, Jonathan mentioned a decision that your elders have made. Now, I wanna I want tell you, this is an unbudgeted decision, and so we're gonna cover the cost of these scholarships through Fifth Sunday dollars. And we got a Fifth Sunday coming up uh, later this month, and that'll be a part of the next few announcements that you that you hear about that uh, a part of our fifth Sunday coming up the end of July is gonna help fund some of these scholarships. And we're, we're excited that there's possibly three of our uh, young men that are gonna be going to, to Harding. But you know, one of the things that we've come to realize and the data tells us this over and over, and it's a frightening statistic really, is a lot of our teens that are all sitting here together and they're all got a great friendship and they seem to be doing well, they're gonna turn away. And we're hoping that encouraging them to be a part of a, a college program at a Christian college could possibly make a difference. Let's take care of this baptism. Start 
a new life. You join a family that's going to always be here for you. They'll always be praying for you. And will always help you continue to live for Christ. You made a very important confession this morning. And because of your confession, because of what you believe, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins and the promise of eternal life in heaven. I don't think I've ever seen those camouflage cover off before. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of you dads and some of us grandpas have had the opportunity of doing that. And, and uh, you know, I just, I know where Michael is right now. And that's just a very special place for a dad to be when he has an opportunity to baptize his daughter or granddaughter, grandson, whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. But anyway, just in, in closing out these announcements, I, I do want to encourage you to encourage our young people. You know, we, we, we talk about this and we hear this term of dunk them and chunk them, right? We just kind of throw them out into the world and hope that the world treats them well. We pray over them. We hope they're taken care of and they grow up strong and all of that. But, boy, it's tough out there. You know it's tough. And so we're, we, we decided this past Monday night as we were talking over and meeting that uh, – this was a good way to be good stewards of your money and at the same time uh, encourage our young people to, to, to consider, at least consider seriously, uh, Christian education beyond the high, high school year. So uh, anyway, you'll be participating in that. Your fifth Sunday contributions are going to go toward funding that, uh, uh, funding that scholarship and we will uh, award that directly to the families and, and that will help offset uh, some of the expenses associated with that. Uh, a, a couple other announcements to be made. I know um, in class today, uh, Matthew mentioned uh, Bob and Gwen Coker. Um, Bob, as of Thursday, uh, is under home hospice care. Um, you know, y'all have seen Bob. Bob is, is getting weaker and a little bit more difficult for, for Gwen to, to, to handle at times. And so hospice is going to come in at, at a great time and be a big, big help there. Uh, she did send a, send a note um, that um, says that Bob is now at home, hospice care, uh, as of this past Thursday. Also, and then this is Gwen, she said, also I tested COVID positive Friday. I fully trust God will protect, uh, God will protect Bob from being infected because it's impossible uh, to quarantine from him. I ask everyone to pray for us, especially Bob. Obviously, I don't feel well, but not so bad that I can't see to his needs. It is wonderful that we started hospice when we did. God's hand was in this, of course. I think it, I think it would be good if as many as possible know this. So that's why we're sharing it with you. I don't want, uh, I don't want anyone to come visit right now not knowing about my illness. I will let you know when, the ne when I get a negative test. We miss you and love you all. That's from Gwen. So we want to continue to remember uh, Bob and Gwen uh, as, as they go through the, these uh, illnesses and that she works to, to, to take, care of, uh, take care of Bob. Also, I got a, uh, a letter here that I want to read from, uh, from uh, Vicki Miller. Vicki just says, the family of Betty Eubanks would like to thank every one of you uh, for the love and, and uh, honoring uh, Betty Eubanks during this uh, time of her passing. Uh, especially she wanted to make mention of the kitchen staff and, and the excellent job that you did in providing a meal for the family. So that, that's from Vicki. Also, we learned this past week that uh, Harold Mobley, uh, Tim Mobley's dad, passed away down in Pensacola, Florida. Tim's been there for a while, and uh, the, the funeral is, uh, or the memorial service, as it says in the bulletin, will be on the 30th of the month at 2 p.m. on a Saturday Saturday afternoon. So we want to uh, remember the Mobley family. 
Uh, many of you may have met Harold. They visited with us several times here, and Harold was always a, a big encouragement to us. I want to encourage you all to, to be back this evening. I know we got uh, uh, volunteers that are going to be meeting about 5.15, and uh, youth groups got to be back at 1.15, and so it's going to be a busy, busy day. It's going to be a busy, busy uh, four days now through, uh, uh, now through Wednesday night, so hope to see you all back all back here tonight. If you would be standing, we'll close in prayer. Also, Reagan will be out here in just a moment, and as become a bit of a tradition, I'd like for as many as possible to come down here and gather around her, and let's have that first prayer with her as a sister in Christ. Let's close in prayer right now. Father, thank you so much for days like today, days that we can assemble and we can worship and we can praise and we can honor your son, Jesus. Thank you for being a part of our lives and knowing that we actually dwell in Jesus allows us to look at things differently. We see this world as a temporary home as we look forward to eternity and spending that time with you. Father, we have many in our number that are ill and in particular we ask for the Cokers. We ask that you bless them with a sense of peace and uh, comfort, help to heal Gwen quickly uh, when we pray that you'd be with Bob. Uh, we're, we're grateful for a life well lived and the examples that the Cokers continue to be for all of us. And Father, we pray that you'd be with, uh, be with the doctors and nurses that might be working closely with Bob through hospice care. Uh, we're thankful for time spent with uh, the Eubanks family and in particular we're grateful for Vicki and, and her example uh, as a daughter and the love that she, that she showed for Miss Betty. Father, we ask that you be with the Mobley family. They're away from us and a little too far for it to be convenient, but we know that they know that we love them and we care for them, and we pray that uh, you'd bless the Mobley family as they uh, go through this transition without Harold. Father, you bless us in so many good ways at this place, and as we look forward to this week, historically it's been one of the peaks of our years, and we so look forward to that. We look forward to the number of children that are going to come and be with us, we look forward to the number of children that are going to come through and be blessed by the school supplies that have been prepared for them. We look forward to big numbers, and we look forward to times when we can laugh, and we can share Jesus, and we can tell the story of Jesus from the beginning to the end. And we pray that our children will absorb that, and our adults will come back and be a part of the classes. Father, we just know it's going to be a great week, and we just give you all the glory and the praise for the opportunities that we have for weeks like this. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that we can stand whole in your sight. We can approach your throne of grace and mercy boldly because of Jesus and the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>